Ladies and gentlemen, today, we are diving deep into the economic quagmire Japan is finding itself in, all thanks to the recent indecisiveness displayed by Bank of Japan's governor, Kazuo Ueda. Now, you might ask, why should we care about this? Quite simply, because Japan is the world's third largest economy, and if it sneezes, the rest of Asia might catch a cold. In his latest comments, Ueda Sensei has masterfully avoided giving a clear hint towards a rate hike in December. This has sparked a range of reactions in the financial world, weakening the yen but giving some breathing room to the bond market. So, what is really happening here? For those who have been following Japan's monetary policy, you'll know that the BOJ has been walking on eggshells, trying to manage growth while staving off inflation concerns. And now, with one foot hovering over a potential rate hike, there's a lot of uncertainty brewing. Let's dissect this situation, frame by frame. Japan's ultra-loose monetary policy has been the dominating force in the country for over a decade. The BOJ implemented aggressive stimulus programs to combat deflation and to prop up its aging, stagnant economy. This included buying vast amounts of government debt and suppressing long-term interest rates to spur lending and investment. But guess what? Inflation in Japan has stubbornly not fallen into place like many hoped. Here's where we find ourselves today, Governor Ueda has inherited this economic puzzle. He's tasked with navigating between an economy that cries out for stimulus and an international financial scenario that urges caution in overspending. Years of loose policy have been like sticking pieces of tape over a cracked dam. The Japanese government and the BOJ have played the long game with low interest rates, effectively kicking the can down the road, hoping that inflation would hit their 2% target and growth would catch fire. But that hasn't exactly happened. And now, Ueda's position appears reminiscent of a very complex balancing act, walking the thin line between sustaining growth and preventing runaway inflation. Add to that worsening depreciation of the yen, which hit 155.14 against the dollar on the back of Ueda's lack of definitive rate hike guidance, and you have a currency on the edge of freefall. Remember the days when a strong yen was all the rage? Japanese companies were happy, they had purchasing power, and the country was considered economically invincible. Flash forward to the present, supply chain disruptions, rising global uncertainty, and stagnating growth make it hard for the yen to breathe. So you might think Japan should just raise rates, right? Halt inflation in its tracks and save the currency. But it's not that simple. At the heart of the problem, raising rates too quickly could also throw the country's heavily indebted government, and its economy, into a tailspin. As of now, government debt in Japan exceeds 250% of the national GDP, the highest in the developed world. With such a mind-numbing amount of debt, any substantial move upwards in interest rates could absolutely crush state finances. Ueda said it clearly in his speech, any policy shift depends on economic data. The problem is, when you base major decisions on data, data which can be as uncertain and shaky as the fragile global supply chains, you're putting your bets on ever-moving pieces of a volatile puzzle. But here's the kicker, there's not much room for nuance when you're carrying such heavy burden of both internal and external pressure. Now, let's zoom out a bit to understand the yen's downward spiral. The yen's weakening is not just a minor inconvenience, it's the canary in the coal mine for the larger economic problems Japan is facing. The yen's depreciation is an immediate reaction to the absence of any concrete reassurance of a rate hike. Forex traders, analysts, and financial players were anticipating hawkish signals following Ueda's speech. Instead, they were greeted with caution and ambiguity. The yen stumbled to a low of 155.14 against the dollar, a stark indicator of Japan's precarious position in global currency markets. This continuous weakness risks driving up the cost of imports for a resource-strapped island nation. Japan imports about 90% of its energy. Imagine paying more for oil, natural gas, and raw materials, a nightmare scenario for businesses and consumers alike. Well, exporters, at least in the short term, as the declining yen boosts the competitiveness of Japan's export economy on the global stage. Look at Toyota, Nissan, or Sony. They are all smiling brightly at the favorable FX tailwinds. Their products become cheaper abroad, and that fuels foreign sales and profits. But, and this is a big one, this windfall is likely temporary. If input costs start rising and the value of their profits when converted back to yen diminishes, the long-term picture doesn't look as cheery. And let's not forget the bond market. Traders and investors exhaled when Ueda hinted that no rapid moves were forthcoming, pushing Japanese bond yields down. Keep in mind, in Japan, a significant majority of its sovereign debt is owned domestically through institutional players like the Government Pension Investment Fund, GPIF, or Japanese banks. As yields drop, it further drives down savings returns and effectively penalizes savers, including pension funds. Japan's financial sectors face risks of systemic fatigue. If the BOJ doesn't play its cards right, there's a brewing risk of narrowed profitability across banks. Lower rates diminish the bank's lending margins, 
compressing profits at a time when global competition is heating up and when capital flight could rear its head. In short, Japan has tied its economic fate to an overly reliant position on debt and low interest rates, creating vulnerability as external shocks mount. Japan doesn't operate in a vacuum, and external forces play a gigantic role in shaping its monetary choices. First of all, the United States is an unmissable piece of the puzzle. As the Fed fires on all cylinders with higher interest rates, their currency attracts global capital seekers like moths to a flame. Capital flight away from Japan only deepens the yen's weakness as higher US yields make Japan unattractive for investors. All this has dramatically narrowed the capital flow heading into Japan, making matters worse. While China deals with its own slowing growth, Japan's economy can't ignore its largest neighbor. Any downturn in China, which is a huge buyer of Japanese goods, particularly technology, cars, machinery, would affect Japanese growth forecasts further. Ueda's comments about monitoring US economic conditions weren't without reason. The global economy moves in sync, and the BOJ must orchestrate every decision with the rest of the world looming in the backdrop. Also, we have to consider the global inflationary backdrop. Across various Western economies, inflation has cooled following aggressive central bank rate hikes, but Japan's inflation problem is far subtler. The country finally emerged from years of deflation only recently. However, unlike in the US and Europe, inflation there is still relatively mild, floating around the 3-4% levels, excluding fresh food. Hence, there's less immediate pressure to raise rates, at least from a domestic perspective. What's hanging over Japan now is a delicate waiting game, damned if you do, damned if you don't, scenario. Ueda didn't offer an outright defense of holding rates either. Instead, he left traders and policymakers both anxious and hopeful. Here's the really tricky part. If the BOJ raises rates quickly, we might as well get ready for a sharp contraction in economic growth. Simply, Japan cannot yet afford to slow down abruptly. If rates remain stagnant, though, jittery markets will keep punishing the yen, poverty rates could increase, and the nation's access to affordable imported goods would dwindle further. Digital disruptions to consumer spending are already on the rise, lower-income households are most affected due to rising costs from abroad. So what's the trick here? The most realistic expectation is that we will see small incremental steps, what central bankers love to call gradual policy calibration. The BOJ should aim to slowly raise rates only when it confirms sustained upward price pressures, especially in wages and core inflation metrics. The problem with any data-dependent policy, though, is that predictions are only as good as the data sources you use. Just look at recent data from the US, employment numbers have been up and down like a roller coaster. We can expect UEDA to use every bit of domestic and international economic statistics available, but even those carry a degree of uncertainty because economies are more interconnected than ever. At the end of the day, aside from macroeconomic indicators, social issues weigh heavy here. Japan's shrinking demographics are essentially a ticking time bomb. Japan's rectangle of uncertainty, whether it's the yen, housing prices, consumption levels, or energy imports, stands on fragile ground. For international investors, Japan is both risky and intriguing. There's a contrarian opportunity here. If the BOJ gets its rate hikes right, and avoids a crash landing, then there could be spectacular upsides for global hedge funds eyeing Japanese firms and industries battered by near-term market pessimism. Let's not forget, these subtle balance of power shifts offer special windows for global institutional players. Japan's economic interconnection means that outside forces, especially large institutional investors, are paying close attention to every move made by the BOJ. Japan's stock market, already up this year due to strong corporate earnings and a yen-fueled export boom, could experience further volatility depending on Ueda's actions, or inactions. There's a classic investor angle at play here, risk versus reward. Hedge funds and global investors are positioning themselves to capitalize on any policy missteps or surprises. To truly appreciate the magnitude of the BOJ's current struggle, we need to look at where this all began. Haruhiko Kuroda, the former governor of the Bank of Japan, pursued a relentlessly expansionary policy during his tenure. Kuroda, like many central bankers of his era, strongly believed in the power of quantitative easing, QE, and the magic bullet of ultra-low interest rates to combat Japan's deflationary spiral. Kuroda even toyed with the idea of yield curve control, YCC, where the BOJ committed to holding down long-term interest rates by buying unlimited amounts of bonds. Kuroda's reign marked Japan's longest and most aggressive experiment with monetary easing. Yet, the empirical data post-Kuroda reveals a mixed picture. Inflation barely budged beyond 2%, wage growth stagnated, and productivity improvements were meager. And while markets were flooded with low-cost capital, real economic structural reforms fell by the wayside. 
Now, Kazuo Ueda stands at the glory and scorn crossroads, where Kuroda's unfinished business, dragging Japan out of its deflationary mindset, meets new global pressures, such as rising US interest rates, a hotly contested weakening yen, and Japan's precarious demographic shift. The similarities between Ueda's delicate position now and Kuroda's ordeal are striking. Yet, where Ueda might radically differ is in his approach. He has hinted time and time again at carefully considering global externalities and data shifts before making any swift policy maneuvers. However, the longer he treads the path of caution, the sharper the policy trade-offs become. No discussion about Japan's economic future can exclude its demographic crisis. The nation is aging at an alarming rate, with more than 28% of the population aged 65 and older, and Japan's birth rate in a long-term downward spiral. What does this mean for monetary policy? For one thing, fewer workers mean fewer contributions to GDP growth, fewer savers in the banking system, and more pensioners reliant on government support. It's a vicious cycle Japan hasn't been able to arrest for more than a couple of decades. And no monetary goosing can fix a demographic time bomb. The debt-to-GDP ratio, which stands at an eye-watering over 250%, is another reflection of these demographic realities. Japan is borrowing more and more to pay for social security expenditures, mainly pensions and healthcare, placing immense pressure on fiscal policy. So, even if Ueda opts for a rate hike down the line, it could cripple government finances unless Japan finds a way to boost its admittedly stagnant productivity levels. Even then, there will be major limits. So, what are we seeing here? Japan is caught in a double bind. On one hand, an aging population and rising healthcare costs demand long-term growth strategies and economic reforms. On the other hand, fiscal policy is constrained by the government's massive debt, leaving monetary policy as perhaps the only powerful tool left in Japan's economic toolkit. But here's the uncomfortable truth, monetary policy can only go so far, and Japan is proving to be the ultimate case study in its limitations. We've already touched on the US Fed's aggressive tightening stance, but what lessons can Ueda glean from other global players? In particular, the European Central Bank, ECB, under Christine Lagarde provides an interesting comparison. Europe, similar to Japan, has dealt with stubbornly low inflation for years. However, the ECB's move to normalize interest rates in the face of post-COVID inflationary pressures and energy shortages showed that it's possible to gradually hike rates without crashing the economy, though not without risk. The ECB's latest interest rate hikes have been careful, data-dependent, and transparent. Lagarde has clearly communicated every move along the way, reducing volatility in European bond markets and offering some stability to the euro, even as it faced its own depreciating forces earlier this year. Just like in Europe, Japan can't afford to spook the market. Ueda and the BOJ must strike a delicate balance. Continue too long with ultra-low rates and risk a runaway yen depreciation. But move too quickly or unexpectedly, and you risk amplifying Japan's debt crisis and suppressing already minimal wage growth. As any sound central banker knows, it's controlling expectations that is often more important than the rate hike itself. Japan may also look more closely at China, whose central bank has also wrestled with deflationary pressures. But China's problem is uniquely its own, heavy on hard leverage investments in real estate and infrastructure, and with a much more tightly managed currency. The People's Bank of China, PBOC, has focused on direct liquidity injections and targeted stimulus rather than powerful rate cuts. While Japan might not follow such methods, we do see a common theme, central banking in today's turbulent world isn't just about rates anymore. It's about strategic deployment of a whole policy toolkit. The impact of wage stagnation, combined with rising inflation, is cutting significantly into household budgets in Japan. The increase in consumer price inflation, CPI, over the last 12 months, particularly driven by increasing energy import prices, poses grave risks for working middle-class families. And what's worse, while inflation is still lower than in the US or other developed economies, real wages in Japan have yet to keep pace with this rising cost of living. Japan simply cannot rely on monetary policy alone anymore. For Japan to truly become resilient, it needs bold fiscal reforms paired with ingenious monetary adjustments, such as diversified investments in green energy, digital transformation, and infrastructure redevelopment. The battle ahead is not just conquering inflation, it's paving the way for long-term economic sustainability in the face of a structural labor shortage. Let's now turn our attention back to the yen. Market traders continue to focus on speculative signals from Ueda and the BOJ regarding movements in rates. If this uncertainty continues, we could see the yen slipping further, possibly into 160 territory. A weak yen does benefit exports, but exporting alone won't be enough to save Japan in an inflationary world where buying power for energy and food are critical. Could currency intervention be on the table? Japan has intervened in the yen's value before, most recently in September 2022, when the yen breached the 145 level against the dollar. But that was a temporary fix.
Direct intervention is costly and usually short-lived unless it's coupled with broader macro policy shifts. Thus, unless we see a concerted multilateral effort between the BOJ and other global central banks to stabilize exchange rates, including coordination between the Fed, the ECB, and perhaps even the PBOC, it's unlikely that unilateral yen interventions will have more than a symbolic effect. At its core, Bueda's challenge is one of synchronized economic strategy. Japan's economy, like the rest of the world, is not immune to shifts in global productivity, inflation pressures, or trade dynamics. The cracks within its own system, including an over-reliance on monetary policy, rising public debt, and an alarmingly shrinking workforce, can no longer be ignored. Japan needs a mix of structural reforms, fiscal discipline, and smart monetary choices to navigate the dangerous waters ahead. If the BOJ continues to play it slow and steady, expect choppy currency markets and prolonged debates over future rate hikes. Should the BOJ swing toward a hawkish stance, indicating imminent hikes or accelerating bond sell-offs, it will force the government to simultaneously adopt aggressive, business-friendly reforms. Winning the long game means adopting short-term pain for long-term structural gain. As we approach the December meeting, the world is watching. But remember, the answers will not arrive solely based on what happens on December 18, 19. There's a broader structural story behind Japan's monetary trajectory. That long story involves facing demographic decline head-on, balancing fiscal prudency with monetary confidence, and navigating the geopolitical and global economic landscapes with unprecedented agility. Ladies and gentlemen, Japan is at a crossroads, and the whole world is paying close attention. Will Ueda and his team of policymakers make the right moves to stabilize the nation's economy, or will they fumble, sinking the yen further and pushing Japan deeper into economic stagnation? Only time, and perhaps brave policy decisions, will tell. This has been a long, comprehensive dive into the Bank of Japan's current positioning. If you've learned something new about Japan's ongoing economic challenges, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments below. Stay tuned for more on global finance as we continue to unpack the world's biggest economic stories. Until next time, keep watching and stay informed.